guys, welcome back to Did It Survive, where I start to take a general breakdown of the original 36 enemies from the original 1986 Legend of Zelda. So far, we have expanded on 23 in the series, including Armos, Lynels, Rope, Zora, Goria, Keese, Dig Dogger, Stone Statues, P Hats, Patra, Wizrobes, Goma, Bubbles, Paul's Voice, Octorox, Guinea, Levers, Moldorm, Dodongo, Gibdos, Gels, Vires, and like likes. If you're interested in seeing any of these, I'll leave the playlist linked right here. Don't forget to leave a like if you've enjoyed this series or if you want to see more videos like this. Without further delay, here's today's video. We are going to start off with a pretty well-known enemy. These bouncy guys are called Tektites. They are found in the overworld hopping around. They're extremely easy to take down with the red Tektite moving a little bit more erratically but only having one heart in health and half a heart in damage. The blue Tektite has a little bit more health with two hearts but it does still do half a heart in damage. The best way to take them out is to stun them with a the boomerang then stab them with the sword. The boomerang's nice to keep them from not only landing on you but it keeps them out of unreachable spots like the mountains. Tektites are found in a ton of Zelda games, including The Legend of Zelda, Adventure of Link, A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Oracle of Seasons and Ages, Four Swords, Four Swords Adventures, The Minish Cap, Twilight Princess, Phantom Hourglass, Spirit Tracks, A Link Between Worlds, Triforce Heroes, and Cadence of Hyrule. There are the original red and blue Tektites, but there are a few specific variants also, one is called the water tektite. These guys actually skim on top of the water like a pond skater, where the blue tektites can jump on the water, but they can't move other than just jumping around. There is a golden tektite in the Minish Cap along with the other golden enemies from the Kinstone Fusions. This tektite is slightly more powerful with her hits, but really nothing unmanageable. I have a pretty decent amount of history with this enemy, but I don't really have any fond memories of them. They didn't do enough damage to kill you outright, but they are annoying having them jump all over the screen, potentially killing you if you had low hearts. I can, however, say without a shadow of a doubt, they really have thrived throughout this franchise, being in 16 out of the 20 main games and even making it into a recent crossover. This next enemy is one of the more identifiable enemies in the whole series. This bulldog-like goblin is respectively called a moblin. They are found in the overworld in the forest areas wielding throwing spears. You can deflect the spears with a basic shield. The red moblin has two hearts and deals half a heart in damage with a throw or a contact hit where the blue moblin has three hearts and deals half a heart and damages with a contact hit, but a full heart with a spear throw. Keep in mind, however, just because these guys are technically enemies, they can also be friendly. You can find them sometimes in caves all across the map of Hyrule. If you find one, they'll give you some rupees telling you the famous line, it's a secret to everybody. Moblins appear in a fair amount of games, including The Legend of Zelda, Adventure of Link, A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, Ocarina of Time, Oracle of Seasons and Ages, Four Swords, The Wind Waker, The Minish Cap, Skyward Sword, A Link Between Worlds, Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, and Cadence of Hyrule. Moblins are usually spear wielding in most games like the original, but there are some other varieties found throughout the series as well. In Ocarina of Time, there's a new large club moblin. In Four Swords and The Minish Cap, there's a bow moblin and a shield moblin in Skyward Sword and A Link Between Worlds. Ironically, in the Oracle of Seasons and Ages, there are both Bulldog and Pig-like Moblins present in both games. They do have another name in both of the Oracle games and Link's Awakening. The pig-looking Moblins are called Borblins. Also in Link's Awakening, there's a mini-boss named Moblin Chief, and in the Oracle games, there's another mini-boss called Great Moblin. Potentially even being the same enemy, they really like Moblins those three games. They also have species that have some sort of descendants from Moblins. They are Begoblins, Miniblins, Bulblins, Big Blends, and Hard Blends. After all that is said, Moblins absolutely thrive throughout the Legend of Zelda series. They're quite possibly one of the most well-known enemies in the whole franchise. Our next enemy is a gelatinous blob. No, not that guy. I'm talking about Zoles. Zoles are found bouncing around throughout most of the levels in the game. They are the whole version of another enemy. Whenever you attack and defeat a Zole, it splits into two gels. We expanded on gels in this video if you're interested in them. Zoles come in a lot of colors in the dungeons, but the colors do not have an effect on their attack or health. All Zoles have one heart and deal one damage with a contact hit. They are found in all levels in both quests and really are as standard as you can get. Zoles are found in The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, Oracle of Seasons and Ages, Four Swords, Four Swords Adventures, and Cadence of Hyrule. In Four Swords, there's a boss named Dara Zul. 
But after it's defeated, instead of gels popping up, the smaller enemies look more like Octoroks. In the Minish Cap, there's code for Zoles and gels to be in the game, but they weren't used. I have a pretty neutral opinion on Zoles. I really enjoy enemies that have combination or stages to them. On the other hand, they can be annoying because of the same mechanic but I think the good outweighs the bad on this one. Zoles have kind of changed into choo-choos over time. They even split up as well. But with this popular enemy conversion, it's diminished the appearance of Zoles throughout the years. These next guys would most likely either scare you or make you dread a level. I'm talking about Gleox. These dragons were found as bosses guarding Triforce pieces. They either had two, three, or four heads that had to be removed with the sword to defeat this boss. While you're trying to land hits on the attached heads, the removed heads float around the room spitting fireballs at you to dodge. Making it more difficult, the magical shield does not defend you from their fireballs. They have 8 health per head, so 16 to 32 per Gleok, so this can become a pretty good fight pretty quickly. In quest 1, Gleoks are found in levels 4, 6, and 8, and in the second quest, in levels 2, 5, and 7. For as powerful as they are, they don't really show up too much in the series, only appearing in The Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Seasons, Phantom Hourglass, and Tears of the Kingdom. Gleox also make a boss appearance in the Minish Cap as a turtle rock combo named Glee Rock. And in Cadence of Hyrule, there's a four-headed version acting as a boss named Gleokenspill. Later on in Tears of the Kingdom, they evolved into elemental dragons, having fire, electricity, and ice abilities, and a few sprinkled here and there that have all three. So it's safe to say that Lynels and Gloom Hands really aren't the biggest problem in this game. I do want to point out also that the dragon boss, Ararok, from Twilight Princess isn't considered a Gleok because of this battle type. But with a new addition to Tears of the Kingdom's gameplay, I feel like it could be argued that they're at least related. Also, a small fact about them in The Legend of Zelda, there's a Gleok in code that only has one head that they never used. Getting back here, the two-headed dragon from Phantom Hourglass was a pretty cool fight. It was kind of like the twin Rova fight. One head sprays fire where the other one blasts you with ice. It could be a difficult fight due to the fact that you had to play on both screens of your DS, and if they go under the water, it can flood the iceberg you're on as well as make chunks of ice fall down on top of you. Although these guys really didn't last throughout the series, they did come back with vengeance. They're extremely strong and hopefully they'll stick around in some fashion. This next enemy is a smart knight and a skilled swordsman. This is the Dark Knight. Dark Nuts are found in most levels in both quests. They march around the screen trying to make contact with you with their swords. They're kind of a pain to take down as well, with the boomerang, magic rod, arrows, and fire not having any effect on them. Your only options are a melee attack with your sword from behind or the side, or try to get lucky with a bomb hit. The best way to effectively use bombs on these guys is to get them to follow you then drop it as you're running because these guys can actually deflect the bombs with their shields. Their skill and difficulty only prosper in the later games. So much, they're usually found as bosses or mini-bosses, making them arguably one of the hardest enemies in the whole series. There's quite a lot of different styles for Dark Nuts as well, from the original having red and blue versions with different levels of health, with the red having 4 and the blue having 8 with their contact hits both having 1 heart. From here you have the Black Dark Nut, Black Knight, Golden Dark Nut, Green Dark Nut, Mighty Dark Nut, and Silver Dark Nut, along with the two originals. They appear in The Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening, Oracle of Seasons and Ages, Four Swords, The Wind Waker, The Minish Cap, Twilight Princess, and Cadence of Hyrule. I can go ahead and tell you that the Dark Nuts from Twilight Princess still give me nightmares. These guys are literally one of the hardest enemies I've ever faced in any video game. From their high health, two-part battle style, and just their sheer intimidating size compared to Link, they're just a handful. On top of putting two of them right before Ganon's fight, Nintendo really was testing her willpower with this one. On the other hand, this is probably one of the best battles I've ever had in a video game. The same attributes I don't like made the fight so much more intense, and you get a sense of accomplishment once you've seen them fall. But the question is, did the Dark Nuts survive throughout time? I hate this answer, but I don't believe it is necessarily survived only being in 9 games out of the 20 main games. But the games that they are in are sure to leave a lasting memory, whether that be a good one or a bad one. Let me know in the comments, did they leave an impression on you? Our last enemy for today is actually a type of piranha plant. This is Manhandela. It has four hands that spit fireballs at you as their way of defending themselves. As you take off his hands, the enemy will get faster until all the hands are destroyed. If there are stone statues shooting orbs in the room, they will also speed up with the Mahandala. They aren't affected by the boomerang or fire, the magical shield is also useless here. It can only be effectively damaged by your sword, arrows, the magical rod, and bombs. 
Bombs will do the most damage, taking a complete handoff, or even better, if you land the bomb correctly in the center of the manhandler, you can one-shot this enemy with each hand having 4 hearts, making it 16 in total, making a bomb perfect for the job. This is a dual enemy. In the first quest, it's a boss in level 3, a mini boss in level 4, and a normal enemy in level 8. In the second quest, they're more of a standard enemy rather than a boss. They're in levels 2, 5, 6, and 7. Manhandlers only show up in a handful of games, including The Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Seasons, Four Swords, and Four Swords Adventure. They do, however, get confused with the Deku Bob in later games. There's no official linkage between the two, but they are definitely related to some extent, especially if you look at the Diababa from Twilight Princess next to the Manhandler. The only real experience I have with them is from the original Legend of Zelda. It's killed me more times than I'd like to admit, but the more you see this enemy, the easier it is to take down, just like any other enemy. Overall, the Manhandler really didn't make it throughout the franchise. It would be interesting to see in a 3D game, but I don't really know if it'd be possible with the game mechanics that the enemy has. But it would be cool to see as a boss again. I hope you guys liked the enemies that we went over today. That makes the total number 30 out of the 36 original enemies, meaning that there's only one more episode left out of the series. There'll be a long video posted shortly after the last video compiling all the videos with additional information added in. So if you're interested, feel free to watch the series and let me know any side information that you might know or want me to add in on an enemy. I linked the playlist at the beginning of the video and I'll leave it again in the description below. If you like the series so far, don't forget to drop a like and subscribe for more video game content. Let me know in the comments what your favorite enemy is out of the whole franchise. With that, be safe, try something new, and I'll see you next time, guys.